Hello, Honors Chem students. This is Mr. Keister here again with you today. This is the video for Monday, October 5th, 2020, which is our scheduled 32nd day, I believe, of school for the fall semester. Always keep in mind, though, that the dates could change for a variety of reasons, but the lessons and the order that those lessons are presented will remain the same regardless. So let's take a look at the do nows and see our schedule for today. So today we're going to look at uh, energy calculations. So you picked up page 49. Uh, Friday, we worked with energy bar charts, LOL charts, and learned how to do those. In fact, your homework for today was to complete the energy bar chart assignment. Uh, that is due now. So if you're here in class, you will have turned that into the desk. If you're at home, you will have submitted that to me electronically uh, during your scheduled class period. Uh, the answer key, of course, is posted here on the board as well as on the answer keys page in Canvas. Uh, both of that, both of those were done by 7 a.m. this morning. So today we're going to continue the second half of Unit 2 regarding energy. We'll learn how to do energy calculations for both thermal energy, which remember is evidenced by a temperature change, and phase energy, which is evidenced by a phase change. You'll have an assignment over this that is due tomorrow. And also, big reminder, the Unit 1 and Unit 2-1 review assignment, which is the first review for the fall semester exam, uh, that is due tomorrow now at the beginning of class. We've had that now for several days. Uh, again, no answer key posted for this or any other semester review. So I would suggest you communicate with your friends and classmates. Uh, check your work with each other before you get that thing turned in, and it is due tomorrow at 7.30. Do not forget, it's worth a lot of points. You don't want to turn that one in late, or especially not at all. So, all right, let's uh, pull up the uh, notes for today and get going. All right. Let's see here. All right. Thermal energy and the three states of matter. As the temperature of a substance changes, of course, an amount of thermal energy is either released or absorbed by the substance. Remember, thermal energy and temperature are directly proportional. The amount of energy involved in that change is directly proportional to these quantities. First, the specific heat capacity. Uh, before I even mention that, let's remember that uh, the uh, energy involved, remember we call energy or heat energy Q, all right? Remember that from our uh, energy bar charts, our LOL charts. Remember, though, that Q is equivalent to thermal energy, phase energy, and chemical energy if there's a chemical change involved. So Q is a combination of all three of those, okay? Now we're gonna be dealing with Q, all right? So the amount of energy Q is involved is directly proportional to these three quantities. First, specific heat capacity. This is the amount of energy required to raise or change, could be lowering it too, uh, to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius, all right? The greater the value of C, the more energy is involved, all right? So C and Q are directly proportional. The larger the value of C, the more energy Q is involved. Secondly, and on the next page, mass. The more mass or the more particles there are, the more energy is involved, all right? So here again, mass and Q are directly proportional. And third, the change in temperature or delta T, all right? Remember when you have the Greek letter delta, the triangle in front of the variable, that means the change in. The difference in the substance's final and initial temperature, another TF minus TI, the greater the temperature change, 
the more energy is involved. So again, delta T and Q are directly proportional. So Q is directly proportional to all three of those quantities. Since this amount of energy either absorbed or released during a temperature change is directly proportional to all three quantities, then it can be calculated by derivation of the meaning of specific heat capacity. Here's what I mean by that. Let's advance the page here. As an example, liquid water has a specific heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, all right? The heat equation that will allow us to calculate the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of 75 grams of water, so there's a mass, from 15 degrees Celsius, that's an initial temperature, to 85.0 degrees Celsius, that is a final temperature, can be derived as follows. So, this is the heat capacity C for water, all right? There are 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Gram degree, gram and degree Celsius, this is a complex unit, are both in the denominator. And remember, meaning that those units have a number of one attached to them. So there are 4.184 joules of energy per one gram of that of water uh, per one degree Celsius in temperature change, all right? If we set up a proportion and then set up over here, X joules, this would of course be Q, and we plug in the numbers that they gave us here, 75.0 grams, which of course is the mass, and then 70.0 degrees Celsius, which of course is our change in temp. T final minus T initial, all right? Or 85.0 minus 15.0, all right? So basically, we're setting up a proportion that relates the value of specific heat capacity for water to the scenario we have been given up here. And if we solve for X, all right? We're gonna cross multiply and divide. So we have x times 1 times 1, which is just x, all right? So x is equal to 4.184 times 75.0 times 70.0, all right? So what does this give us? Well, x is q. 4.184 is c. 75.0 is m. And 70.0 degrees Celsius is our change in temperature. And from that, we have derived an equation that relates the three quantities, mass, specific heat capacity, and change in temp to Q, or heat energy, all right? And this is it right here. Normally, it's uh, written in a little different order. And so our derived equation then, or Q, involving a temperature change, is Q equals MC delta T. That's the way it's normally written, all right? This is called the heat equation. What it really is, involves is calculating Q during a thermal energy change, which of course involves a change in temperature. All right. Now let's go to the next page. Substances with low specific heat capacity, such as metals, don't hold heat very well. You heat up an empty metal pan on the stove, it gets hot very quickly. But as soon as you remove it from the burner, it cools off equally quickly. All right? It doesn't hold heat well. Substances with high specific heat, such as water, do hold heat very well. They heat up and cool down much more slowly. All right? So put a, fill that pan full of water and 
put it on the stove, it takes quite a bit longer to heat up the water. Uh, but once it gets hot, it stays hot longer. That's because water has a high heat capacity. It holds heat much better. So let's do some examples here involving Q and thermal energy. So the first one, how much heat energy is required? So we're looking for Q to raise the temperature, all right, to raise the temperature of 225 grams of water. That's mass. It's at an initial temperature of 25.0 Celsius. That's our T initial, TI, to 90.0 degrees Celsius, which is our final temp, or TF. And here is the heat capacity of water, 4.184 uh, joules per gram degree Celsius. So we're going to use our heat equation, Q equal MC delta T. We're solving for Q. So we have 225 grams is our mass. Specific heat capacity, 4.184. And our change in temp, T final, is 90.0 minus 25.0 for TI. Of course, if you go ahead and do that, TF minus TI, uh, that is uh, 65.0 degrees. Multiply all those together, and based on our uh, uh, sig figs in our uh, data here looks like the fewest is three. You actually get an answer of 61,191 joules, but we got to get that to three sig figs, so 61,200 joules. Okay, 61,200. Now let's plot that on a heating curve. All right. So remember a heating curve, we have temperature in Celsius on the Y, time on the X. So at time zero, we're starting at 25 degrees, 25.0 there. We end up uh, at, what do we end up at? 90.0 degrees, which would be up here, of course. And so we're going to start there. Of course, this takes some time to get there. There's our line there of course this involves a change in thermal energy you notice that this is a heating curve all right that the slope is positive well it should be you're raising the temperature of something you're adding heat uh, to this water to uh, increase its temperature which of course is an endothermic process and those should involve a positively sloped line okay all right second one the addition of 6505 joules of heat energy, so there's Q, is required to raise the temperature of 125 grams of water, there's the mass, that's at an initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, 20.0, so there's our initial temp, to what final temperature? So we're looking for TF. Again, specific heat capacity is given 4.184. All right, so let's do Q equal MC delta T. Q is 6505, so it says it's the addition of 6505 joules. So again, this has been added, it's absorbed. So uh, this 6505, of course, would be a positive value. 6505, M is 125, C is 4.184, and delta T, of course, we do not know. So uh, Let's do this. Let's multiply those two out and divide it. So 125 times 4.184 is 523. So we divide both sides by 523 and delta T to, let's see, looks like three sig figs uh, comes out to be uh, 12.4 degrees Celsius. Now, it didn't ask us for delta T, it asked us for the final temp. So remember that delta T equals T final minus T initial, all right? Our delta T is 12.4, our T initial is 20.0, and minus, or I should say TF minus 20.0. 
So we're going to add 20.0 to both sides. That cancels, and our final temperature then is 32.4 degrees Celsius. 32.4 degrees. Okay. And uh, while I'm thinking about it, <clears throat> uh, this is actually an intermediate calculation. So I guess I probably shouldn't have rounded that based on our rules. So actually that is 12.4378585 degrees Celsius, which would then go right here. But again, when you add 20.0, the fewest number of decimal places is one decimal place. And so our final answer would remain 32.4 degrees Celsius. So sorry about that, my mistake. Remember, don't round an intermediate calculation. All right, third one, let's read this. Oh, well, let's do our graph here. Again, this is the addition of heat. So I think we're looking at a cooling or a heating curve. It should be anyway. Well, let's see, what do we know here? Well, we started at T initial was 20. 0 right there t final is 32.4 not a whole lot higher 32.4 so about right like so there's our thermal energy change again it should be a uh, positively sloped graph since uh, q is positive right the addition of the heat energy so that takes care of that one all right let's look at the last one here Cup of coffee, mass 175 grams, cools from 75, cools from 75.0 degrees. That's our initial temperature down to room temp 25. Gee, this sounds like uh, the uh, one we did uh, with our uh, LOL chart, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't have all this extra information, though. No. Uh, how much heat energy does it release? Looking for Q now to the surroundings, and here's the value of C. So just to just to give you an FYI, so when we're dealing with uh, energy bar charts, LOL charts, we used an arbitrary unit of energy, the bar. All right. Now we are using the the actual units of energy uh, that are used, the SI unit, which of course is the joule. All right. So. No real difference there when we were doing energy bar charts rather than using actual units. We were just using the arbitrary unit, the bar, and now we're using the relevance. Okay? Same thing, though. All right, so we got Q equals MC delta T. All right, so we have M175, C4.184. Uh, T final is 25, remember it's T final minus T initial for delta T, 25.0 minus our initial temperature, 75.0. I hope you notice right away here that that's going to give us a negative number, all right? It's going to give us a negative number, as it should, because uh, we're releasing energy to the surroundings, and when we draw our cooling curve, we're going to notice now why this answer comes out negative. So we have Q then, again, the three sig figs. Well, the actual answer is minus 36,610 joules, which to three sig figs would be negative 36,600 joules to three sig figs. All right? I'm going to make a comment on that here in just a second. All right? Energy is not negative, all right? What's the least amount of energy something can possess at absolute zero? What do we say? How much energy is there at absolute zero? None, all right? Zero. That is the least amount of energy one can possess. Zip, all right? So this answer is negative. Is there such a thing as negative energy? No. Well, maybe other than the negative energy I'm feeling from you guys right now, haha. -ha. 
But no, there is no neg such thing as negative energy. Uh, so what is this telling us since we get a negative answer? Well, it's telling us that this is an exothermic situation, an exothermic process. In other words, energy is being lost or released to the surroundings from the substance. That's why it's negative, all right? The negative sign is just telling us the direction of the energy flow, which is out, okay, or lost. And so what this means then is that it's 36,600 joules released or lost. I want you to understand that, all right? There is no such thing as negative energy, just like there's no such thing as negative mass or negative time or anything else, all right? We just say if we lose time, then of course the time calculation may come out negative. All right, if we lose mass, the mass calculation might come out negative, but it doesn't mean it's negative, all right? It just means that that, that quantity has been lost or released, all right? And so anyway, same goes here. Well, let's graph this thing. So here's uh, temperature in Celsius and time. We're starting at 75 degrees, 75.0. We're ending up at 25.0. So look here. Here's our thermal energy. What's the slope of that line? It's negative. All right. It should be. We lost energy. The temperature dropped. All right. Temp final minus temp initial is negative. Hence the negatively sloped line. The slope of this line in this answer here sine wise should match up which is negative all right so this this confirms why mathematically our energy calculation is negative but again in reality energy is not negative all right it's just released or lost to the surroundings from the substance all right gotta remember that gotta remember that all right let's go on to the next page Now, phase energy and phase changes. When a change of state or a phase change takes place, a substance is converted from one state of matter to another by the addition or removal of heat energy. This is significantly greater amount of heat energy over and above its specific heat capacity, which we call then its phase energy. Remember when a substance is, uh, is changing phases, its temperature does not change. It remains constant. The energy that's involved there is not thermal energy. It's phase energy. So there is no temperature change. Instead, there's a change of phase. Right? While thermal energy is being added during the phase change, the temperature of the substance remains constant until the change is complete. Energy is being switched back and forth between the thermal and phase counts. Since there is no temperature change, the amount of heat energy is now only directly proportional to two things. The specific heat of the phase change, got a little different name now, instead of calling it specific heat capacity, we call it specific heat of phase change, and the mass. And it's calculated by the following equation, known as the phase change equation. Now the energy involved is only directly proportional to two things. There is no temp change, so that's out. It's only proportional to the mass and to the heat of phase change, which is the constant now. And so here is our equation, Q equals M times H. It's not C now, it's capital H for heat of phase change. The little X subscript, well, there are various phase changes. You know, we have melting, boiling, solidifying, or I'm sorry, yeah, solidifying or freezing and condensing. So that X name could change, but it's one of those four. So Q is the amount of heat energy in joules, M is the mass in grams, and H subscript X is the heat of phase change. This is the amount of heat energy required to change one gram of a substance from one phase of matter to another. So heat energy must be either absorbed, gained, or released, lost, in order for a phase change to occur. So we have... 
solid going to a liquid, all right, that's going to be the addition of energy. So that value is positive, all right. We call that melting. The uh, name of the heat of phase change is called the heat of fusion, or HF, and this has a positive value. Liquid to solid, which is the reverse, all right. This, we commonly call it freezing. Correct term is heat of solidification, all right, and uh, it, of course, has a negative value. These two have the same numerical value. Heat of fusion and heat of solidification, melting, freezing. Those two things occur at the same temperature, all right. We're just taking heat in the opposite direction. One is absorbing heat, the other is releasing, all right. But numerically, they're the same. We just put a different sign on it. Liquid to gas is positive. That's caused by the absorption of heat. We call it commonly boiling. It's actually called vaporization. And the uh, phase change constant is called the heat of vaporization. So that's positive. And the opposite of that, gas to liquid is called condensation. That constant is called the heat of condensation, or HC. It, of course, is negative. And these two have the same numerical value. If something's boiling or vaporizing uh, or it's condensing, those two things occur at the same temperature. You know, one's a liquid forming a gas, one's a gas forming a liquid. Those occur at the same temp. It's just a matter of whether we're adding or removing heat to cause one of those two things to happen. Okay? So melting and vaporizing are both endothermic processes. Heat must be absorbed for the change, phase change to occur. So those are positive. As is sublimation. All right, sublimation is another phase change. Maybe you've heard this term before. Uh, sublimation is a uh, solid going directly to a gas without passing through the liquid phase. Very few things do that at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, carbon dioxide is one. We often call it dry ice, all right? So solid carbon dioxide or frozen carbon dioxide is used in fog machines, all right? Like at dances and so forth, or weddings. So uh, how does that happen? Well, at standard temp or room temp and standard pressure, uh, carbon dioxide's boiling point is lower then it's melting point. And so it doesn't melt, all right? It just goes straight to a gas, hence the fog, all right? Um, not too many things do that. Got to have very specific uh, intermolecular forces involved there for that to happen. Uh, and so it doesn't happen all that often. Iodine's another thing that does that. Iodine goes go straight from a solid to a gas, all right? Uh, so those are all endothermic process phase changes. Condensation and freezing or solidification or exothermic, all right, heat energy must be released for the phase change to occur, all right? So they get a negative value. As is deposition, deposition is the opposite of sublimation, a gas going directly to a solid. Very, very few things do that at... Uh, normal temperature and standard pressure. Uh, water will do it uh, at, at a very low pressure up in the far reaches of the atmosphere. Um, water vapor can turn directly into ice crystals, uh, but again, at, sta at standard pressure, it's not going to happen. But up in the far reaches of the atmosphere where pressure is extremely low, it can. All right, so very few things do that. Uh, let's advance this up. <clears throat> so we have seen where phase changes or changes of state occur uh, on a heating or cooling curve. Let's remind ourselves of that here real quick. So remember, this is a heating curve, which is endothermic, all right, where uh, everything is positive. And then this is a cooling curve, which is exothermic. Everything's negative. So remember, a heating curve looks like this. And a cooling curve looks the opposite. 
All right. So here's our temp and our time. Same here. So remember that uh, <clears throat> here are where our phase changes occur. The two horizontally sloped or zero slope lines. All right. So remember, this is our solid phase. This is solid to liquid, which is melting, which is the heat of fusion, right? Heat of fusion. Here's our liquid. Here's our liquid to gas, which is boiling, or our heat of vaporization, HV, all right? And then here's our gas phase up here. So our two, so this right here is our melting point temperature. This right here is our boiling point temperature. For water, of course, that's zero and 100, all right? On the opposite side, so now we have our gas. We have our gas going to a liquid. That is condensation. Phase change constant, heat of condensation. Here's our liquid. Here's our liquid to solid. That is freezing, condensing, that constant is called the heat of solidification, and this of course is our solid phase, and again, right here, same two temperatures as over here, only now they're called something different, here it was called the melting point, here it's called the freezing point temperature, same temp, all right, just different direction of heat flow and up here which we call the boiling point on a heating curve on a cooling curve we call it the condensation point temperature okay again same same temperature different direction of heat flow all right so here are our phase changes no change in temp hence a different equation how much heat energy is added q 500.0 grams of ice to melt it at its melting point. So this is a phase change, all right? Here's the heat of fusion of ice, 334 joules per gram. Remember to change a gram of water from uh, by one degree Celsius, 4.184 joules. To change a gram of ice to a gram of water takes 334 joules, a significantly greater amount, as we discussed a little earlier. So we have Q equals M times the H of fusion now, all right? Mass is 500.0, heat of fusion 334. So our fewest sig figs there is 3, 500.0 times 334. Well, my answer actually comes out to 3 sig figs, so I don't have to round it, 167,000. So we're good there. Let's draw our curve. So this is a phase change. So uh, what's the slope of the line? I hope you said zero because that's what it is. So what, at what temperature does ice melt? Well, that would be uh, zero degrees. All right. And so all it does is stay right there. This is a phase energy change, phase energy, all right? All right. Uh, next page is the last one. How much heat energy must be removed? Q. Removed now. From 250.0 grams of steam to condense it to water at its condensation point. Here's our phase change constant for steam. Negative 2260 joules per gram. Why is it negative? Because we have to show that this is a loss of energy. All right, again, that doesn't mean it's negative, but we're telling the direction of heat energy flow, which is out. All right, we got to teach. Take, you got to take heat energy out of steam in order to condense it to water. Okay, so here's Q is uh, mass times the heat of condensation now, or HC. 
So we have 250.0 times negative 2260. Now it looks like we're going to need the uh, three sig figs there. I think the answer actually comes out to three sig figs. Let me double check that though. Yes, it does. We get an answer of negative 565,000 joules. Here again, remember there is no such thing as negative energy. It's just telling the negative sign is telling us the direction of heat energy flow, which is out or removed. And so again, this is 565,000 joules removed or released. All right, so make sure you make that notation. All right, now let's uh, look at our graph. So we have temp in Celsius time, and uh, we're start. Where does the where does steam condense into water? Well, I believe that's at a hundred degrees. All right. Same place water boils. So we start at 100 degrees and we're removing thermal energy. All right. So there we have it. Again, note that Q is positive when an endothermic phase change takes place, which is melting or vaporization, and Q is negative when an exothermic phase change takes place, such as condensation or solidification. So we're going to stop right there. I do want to look at one of your homework problems because it's a little bit different and I want to show you how to do it. So let me pull up the homework assignment and I will be right back. I know it's here somewhere. There it is. All right. I want to look. Yep, there's our assignment. Let's look at number seven. Actually, I'm going to look at number six and number seven. All right. I think. So let's take a look at it. Okay. Yeah, we're going to look at six first since six and seven are related. Can you make a note of that on my notes? <clears throat> okay. Number six. Suppose a bag full of ice, 3,650 grams. So there's the mass. At 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius, sits on the counter and begins to melt to liquid water. How much energy must be absorbed by the ice if one third of it is melted? All right, so we're looking for Q. This is a phase change. All right, this is a phase change. So, uh, whoops. Wrong problem. Well, that was stupid. That's number five. I want to do number six. My bad, everyone. Scratch that. You can do that one yourself. Note on that, though, it said one-third of the ice. So the mass, of course, that's given, you would want to divide by three. There, I just gave you a free tidbit. So there you go. Well, let's look at six now, like we're supposed to. A serving of Cheez-Its. Mm, love those things. Releases 135 kilocalories of energy. Oh, we're going to have to get that into joules, all right? Given it gives us our uh, conversion here. When digested by your body, if this same amount of energy, so this is Q here, were transferred to 2,550 grams of water mass at 27 degrees Celsius, that's our initial temperature. What would the final temperature be? So we're looking for T final. All right. Well, first things first, let's get this uh, kilocalories into joules. 
okay? So we have um, 135 kilocalories over one times 4180 joules over one kilocalorie. All right. And that then comes out to be 564,300 joules. Uh, this is an intermediate calculation. I am not rounding it. All right. Now, Q equal MC delta T. We got a temperature change here. So we use the heat equation. So we have our Q, 564, 300. Our mass is 2550. Heat capacity of water, 4.184. And delta T, all right, delta T. So we want to divide out what's in front of delta T, 2550 times 4.184. 10,669.2, going to divide that out, and delta T then, 5,6,4,3,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,0,
zero two six five five grams. That's how much water this amount of energy will boil or vaporize. Now it says we have 2,500 grams of water. It's only going to boil 249 of those 2,500 grams. All right? Now, if this answer here had come out to be 2,500 or greater, it would have boiled all of it. But it's not going to. We don't, it'd be like turning the burner on, boiling 249 grams of it, and turning the burner off. That's basically the situation we have here, all right? It's not enough energy to boil all of that water. So what percentage of it did boil, right? So the percent boiled then would be the amount that we calculated, 249.6902655, divided by the amount of water we have, 2,500, and then times 100 to put it into a percentage. Now we'll round the three sig figs. And it comes out to 9.9, almost 10%, 9.99%. Okay. Remember, we didn't round there till the very end. So there's problems similar to that. Again, another one similar to that on this assignment. Now you should be able to do that. And if you run across one like that in mastering, hint, hint, you should now know how to do that one as well. So. That's it for today. Rescue the assignment's all yours. So until next time, this is Mr. Keister signing off. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Keep working hard and stay focused. Catch you guys later. So long.